Praise the name of the Lord. Good evening, brothers and sisters. We greet you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful to be together with those who believe the same thing you believe? Amen. Amen. It's such a comfortable place because we know we can set aside everything and just allow the Lord to just bathe us in His goodness and His grace. What a privilege it is tonight. May the Lord bless each one of you as we've gathered around the Word of the Lord. We're so thankful for what He has done for us. I neglected to mention this morning, but for the young people, just please take note. Friday night, we have youth meeting here, Lord willing, 7 o'clock. So uh, just remember that in your schedules. Just uh, put aside the time to come, spend time with the Lord, spend time in fellowship. It is always most rewarding to be where the Lord wants us to be and to fulfill his purpose in our lives. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Psalms 137. Thank you, musician, song leader. What a privilege we have to serve a living God. <clears throat> Psalms 137. And uh, I wanted to just continue a little further on our thoughts from this morning. In particular, just wanted to emphasize part of something that has been really heavy on my heart as far as this series uh, are, is concerned. We, uh, we realize we go through certain things that there are places, objects, there are things that are tangible. But the scripture is never just speaking about one thing. There's a compound meaning to these things. And I want to just emphasize some of that a little this evening as we go into the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Psalms 137, he says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Oh my, how it is sometimes that we have to land up away from what we love away from where we should be before we realize what we had. It took Israel to come into a condition of captivity, Babylonian captivity, away from Jerusalem. Scripture says, there by the rivers in Babylon they sat down. Then it came tears, weeping, regret, right? Where, why? When we remembered Zion. We hang our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there that carried, they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Oh my, it's not my thought, but I want to just stand there for a moment. Let us recognize this. Again, I'm talking about the anti-type. Babylon. Babylon is a type of the world. It's a type of the systems we were in bondage to. It's a type of denominationalism. It is a type of the Roman Catholic Church. Systems of Christianity that is not really Christian. And he says that the real believers were separated from where they should have been. And in that condition, and in a fallen state, and far away from where they should be, the captives think it's business as usual. Sing us a nice song. Let's worship God. Let's bring our praise. Let's do. But the real answer is, how can we? How can we unless we are restored where we're supposed to be? I thank God for a ministry of restoration at the end time that brought us back to a place where we can really sing the songs of Zion, where we can really worship the living God, where we are not infiltrated by all the things that's going out there in the world under the name of worship. But there is a people. You know, Brother Brennan makes a statement, and I know you're standing, forgive me, but Brother Brennan makes a statement. He says, when the word has gone forth, now comes your time to worship. What we're saying is that the motivation for our worship comes from the word of God, not 
from some other motivation, whether that be emotions, music, styles, all kinds of things. So much can take the place of what really worship should be. But may God help us. He says further, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. I trust this evening that we recognize that there is an antitype to this very thing, and we are in that position by God's grace. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Let's just bow and pray. Heavenly Father, as we come this morning, this evening, Lord, we're just so grateful for all that You've done for us. Lord, we are so dependent upon You. We can do nothing without You that gives us the strength. And we ask that You will truly be with us now. Give us the strength, Lord, as we have come desiring in our hearts to serve You to offer the best that we can in worship and adoration to you. May you receive from our hearts, Lord, that which we bring before you with thanksgiving and worship and praise. May you touch our hearts with your precious word. Hide the vessel of clay and let your name be glorified, Lord. Above all things, may we remember what you have done for us. You have taken us, restored us, shown us so much grace. Lord, even as a David we saw this morning stand in the midst of trial and says, I will rather fall under the hand of God because He is merciful. And Lord, we look at Your mercy this night in the precious name of Jesus Christ. May You touch us, be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As we look this morning at certain things and from the Scripture just being able to tie the Scripture back to a specific place of fulfillment, uh, as you're well aware, as we've been talking in the last two services on uh, a ground zero of a different kind, really a ground zero in, in God's great plan. and. I have tried, as I said, to keep reminding the believers that I'm not just looking at a, a carnal thing because there is the natural uh, election of Israel and, and the blessedness that they receive, but we realize that they are typing, shadowing what God is doing in the Gentile church. At the same time, as we recognize that, we also realize that Israel is a timepiece because they are the natural election, we can watch how God is dealing with them, whatever stage that they are going through, and it will tell us what is happening with those who are the spiritual election. Now, when we looked at it this morning from Matthew, the Scripture tells us that the disciples privately came to Jesus saying, when is this? When will this happen? When is this temple going to be destroyed? When will be the end of the world? How will these things be? Asking questions, relevant questions. And as he starts to answer them, we recognize that he is going right back to Daniel. And he's picking up the things that would take place, the destruction of the temple, the building of the Dome of the Rock, and finally bringing it back to a time of the Gentiles being fulfilled and then the return of God's favor to Israel. Now, I want to just say this as we approach this tonight, that Jesus there is really dealing with the beginning and the ending of the Gentile dispensation. He sums that up 
for them to understand that in their walk with God, and we all very familiar with the Scriptures, and we'll read some of it maybe tonight from some of the quotations, the Word of the Lord teaches us that God had allocated to Israel, according to Daniel's vision, a period of 70 weeks by type, which really was divided into years of ministry. And finally, there was one week left before Messiah came. When Messiah comes, we found that in the midst of the week, Messiah is cut off. Amen. And I want you to notice here is where you start seeing the twofold application of the scripture. Because as you would see Titus later coming and destroying the temple, Jesus had already proclaimed that he was the temple. When he t told them, you break down this temple in three days, I'll raise it up again. Now what are we looking at? We realize that he, his body was actually crucified on a Roman cross. As our brother just had us sing that song, that old rugged cross. But it was a Roman cross. It was the Roman system that cut that week in half. That allowed then, because of the cutting of that uh, a break in that ministry to Israel that would allow the Gentile dispensation to come in. When the Gentile dispensation runs out, God's favor returns to Israel and they have three and a half years left. Amen. Not like some churches teach a whole week. It's three and a half years that's left. You look at the book of Revelation, it constantly reminds you of this principle. The scripture speaks about times, time, and a half a time. That's three and a half. Or 1,268 days. You divide that, you find you sit with three and a half years different ways. It's given through the scripture every time. So when Brother Branham talks about three and a half year per tribulation period and the time when Israel is hearing the message to them, he is absolutely accurate according to the scripture. But now Jesus is answering their question. <clears throat> and I want to just quickly take a portion here from the message beginning and ending of the Gentile dispensation. Brother Brown says, if you notice, the Gentiles started off with idol worship. Now, he does not start where we start. I know for us, we think that time when the Jews stood there and said, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us. We, we take that as the moment where they rejected him, we get favor. But Brother Branham goes way back before that, Listen where he goes. He says, They was worshipping a great idol sitting out in the field, an idol of a man, I believe Daniel himself. Because King Nebuchadnezzar had called him Belshazzar, which was his God, and he started worshipping an image of a righteous, holy man. Hmm. Right back there, at the time of the captivity. Now the very reason Israel was taken captive was because of idol worship. They come into a nation where there is idol worship. And, and I trust we realize that right there they start seeing the foolishness of idol worship. One of their own, a wise man, is exalted so and placed on such a pedestal that the king actually makes an image to him. Is that not what we see so many times? When God places a gift on somebody, we start elevating the man. We don't recognize it's a gift of God operating through the man. And we so often want to put somebody on a pedestal. You've got to hear this brother. You've got to be in his church. You've got to be here. You've got to be there. No! I believe God has got believers right across the face of the earth. In every nation, the scripture says the gospel would go there. And sometimes in great humility and in very difficult circumstances of poverty, they're worshiping under trees. They sometimes have hardly any message books to go through and, and things like that. But I believe God is faithful to let the believers under that tree hear the same truth of the message as we would hear in this place by His grace. He knows exactly who are His. And he places 
a ministry to feed his flock. But now notice Brother Branham says, and Daniel refused to do it, so did the Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the way it was issued in, and it was condemned. The head of gold was issued in by image worship, forced to it, and ended up in a supernatural hand writing a supernatural language that only supernatural understanding could understand it. Amen. And you remember that that was really the Babylonians, their kingdom started like that and finally ended with a handwriting on the wall. That's the way the Gentile kingdom issued in and it'll go out the same way. Now these things are important for us to know. He says, that's right. By supernatural works, supernatural interpretation. I would like to just quote what Brother Branham says. You know, in his early part of his ministry, he had a lot to do with people who were emphasizing speaking in tongues as the gift that everybody had to have in their life. So you would have found that many churches, if you spoke in tongues, you have the Holy Ghost. If you didn't, you don't have it. And then Brother Branham makes a statement. He says, tongues is not a sign of life, but a sign of death. Now that does not mean that when somebody speaks in tongues, that that's, he says, no, it's showing the death of the Gentile dispensation. It ushered in, the early church did, with tongues. When we come to the end here, we find tongues, once again, supernatural language interpreted, being shown that God is finished with the Gentiles. Now, it says, the working of the supernatural. You know what I'm talking about. He says, the working of the supernatural. Oh, how marvelous. Aren't you happy tonight? You believe in the supernatural? Yes. Now then, after these visions, he showed him just where the nations would be standing. He showed him how that there were so many years dependent yet on the Jews. He said, the Messiah, he'll be cut off, which is seven years, 70 weeks is determined for thy people, seven years of prophecy to the Jews. He said, and Messiah, the prince, shall come and prophesy in the midst of the seven weeks, seven days. He will be cut off in the abomination, maketh desolations, will stand in its place. Now he is not talking here about Herod's temple. He's talking about the other temple, Jesus Christ, that's cut off. And an abomination that makes desolation is finally built on those grounds. And how we would watch world over on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was cut off. Another shrine has arisen and been built on the grounds that should have housed temples to the Holy God. And people were made to think that they are standing at the right spot and in the right place, but they are actually in a fallen condition. So he says, <clears throat> Messiah the Prince shall come and prophesy in the midst of the seven weeks, seven days, he will be cut off in the abomination maketh desolations, will stand in its place. And they'll tread down the walls of Jerusalem, Gentiles, for a time, time, and dividing of time. Now when Messiah come, Jesus, he preached exactly three and a half years and was cut off for a sacrifice. The daily obligation was taken away. I'm just reading it to you verbatim the way Brother Branham is saying it here. I trust you realize something. When Jesus Christ was crucified, he says the daily oblation was taken away. In the temple, they carried on until the destruction under Titus. But really, it ceased. 
Because no longer did it have a place in God's economy. Because the supreme sacrifice had been offered and accepted for the propitiation of all our sins. Past, present and future. So that we can stand absolutely justified in a finished work at Calvary. But how important it is for us to re realize that still there came a time when actually physically on the grounds in Jerusalem, daily sacrifices ceased. We were there now in December, end of November, December. We saw no worshiper coming to Jerusalem with their lamb. We saw nobody coming with their doves to offer unto the Lord for whatever need they needed to come. Nobody brought sacrifice. What is it? It was cut off. Amen. Exactly fulfilling what the scripture said. Amen. Now, Brother Branham comes back to this. He says, now when Messiah come, Jesus, <clears throat> he says, he preached exactly three and a half years and was cut off for a sacrifice. The daily Obligation was taken away, and the desolate, the ab abomination that maketh desolation, the Muslim of Omar, Brother Branham calls it here, was stood away to, was stood today in the place of the holy temple. The mosque of Omar stands exactly where the temple stood. Now, here's something I'd like to just mention to the church, just for what it's worth to you. Brother Branham talks about the Muslim of Omar here. He talks about the mosque of Omar. Uh, and he interchanges it, I think, three or four times in the message. He calls it the Mosque of Omar. And strictly speaking, it is not. It is referred to as the Dome of the Rock. However, even if you do your searches today on Google and whatever, you're going to find out that they will tell you that often this Dome of the Rock is confused with the Mosque of Omar. When we were there in 1971, we had an Arab guide. And he took us to this place. And he says, the Mosque of Omar. Well, I believe when Brother Branham was there, no doubt the same thing happened. Amen. And right until this time, people still call it that. The reality is, it's not what name you put upon it. The scripture calls it the abomination that maketh desolation. And that is exactly what it is. Amen. And it stood there in the place of where the true temple was supposed to stand. Amen. He says it stands exactly where the temple stood. And he said that they would tread down the walls of Jerusalem over Jerusalem until the Gentile dispensation would be finished. But at the end of the Gentiles, there would still be three and a half years yet to the Jews. I'm so glad. I said this morning, when, when, when you stand there and you see Jerusalem with this, uh, I don't know what to call it, the scripture says abomination that make it, it's a monstrosity of a structure that doesn't belong. It is not in the right shape, it is not in the right design, it is not based on the right faith, it is not for the right purpose, everything about it is wrong. And, and it's just out of place, it's got to go away. And it pains you inside to look at Jerusalem, looking at that thing that is standing in the wrong place. And then we hear that the Lord says, but I have yet a time for Israel. There is yet a time when Jerusalem comes into restoration. Three and a half years is still given to them to be able to embrace their Messiah that they rejected, reverse what brought them into that condition, and finally bring back the kind of worship that they should have. And Brother Ram says, there would still be three and a half years yet to the Jews. Now notice, one of the most striking things of prophetic history. I don't claim to know the prophecy of the Bible, but this is like reading a newspaper. More plain, and that we he read here, we know is the truth. Notice, 2,000, yet 
2,500 years, the Jews has been scattered to every nation under heaven. As God hardened Pharaoh's heart, bringing them back, he hardened Hitler's heart, Mussolini's heart, and so forth, till he drove them back to Palestine. Coming back, they have made them a nation again. And on May the 6th, 1947, the Jewish flag was raised over Israel for the first time for 2,500 years. I'm reading these things, brother, sister, so that we can just realize that these prophecies were made way back. But we're standing at that pivotal point to see it turn. These prophecies were made by prophets who, who never saw motor cars and airplanes, but they described a people driven back to their homeland. The Jewish flag was raised over Israel for the first time for 2,500 years. The oldest flag in the world was raised for the first time in 2,500 years. And he said in the last days, he would raise up an ensign over Jerusalem, showing that the time is at hand. I thank God for a prophet messenger. Because he could take events like that and say to us, this is ground zero for that scripture. When the scripture says there would be an ensign raised over Jerusalem, here is what it is. We stand tonight, 2023, it's history. It's done. That flag's been flying. What's it now? 70 odd years. Amen? Where are we? Where's our timepiece? Amen? would raise up an ensign over Jerusalem, showing that the time is at hand. And notice here not long ago, I seen a prophetic reel played from over there. And they're bringing in those Jews by the thousands, by airplanes. You've seen it in the paper and so forth. Look in Life magazine's been packing it. Thousands of Jews returning. And they asked them, said, what are you returning for? Old, crippled people, packing them on their backs, their young ones was. Said, are you coming back to the homeland to die? Said, no, we're coming back to see the Messiah. Amen? This is 1955. As I have alluded to it, our actual guide that was sharing the responsibility with Brother George Smith, he talks of himself as a secular Jew. In other words, he, he knows he's of Jewish descent, he's come back to the homeland, but he is not religious or active religiously. We spoke with him a little bit, and it wasn't long, and we found out but just a little while back, well, when I say a little while back, in his youth, his family brought him as a young boy from Poland back to Israel. His story is so common amongst the Israelites that have returned. They're coming back. Something is driving them back. As here, openly spoken, we're coming back to see the Messiah. You see, one thing we can learn from the Jews is that when they know God said something, somewhere it must come to pass. Here is a people that are still reading the scriptures about the Messiah because they missed his first coming. They are still under direct expectation that God will keep his word. And where is he going to keep it? In the land that he gave to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob. I thank God that finally they will get it. And they'll understand what has taken place. Now, he says... <coughs> We're coming back to see the Messiah. 
Jesus said, when you see the fig tree putting forth its buds and all the other trees putting forth their buds, know that time is nigh or spring is nigh summer. So when you see these things come to pass, lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawing nigh. <clears throat> Another message here, uh, 1954, Brother Bram says this. He says, that, it, that time... It's near at hand for they're going to tear down this temple and put up the Muslim of Omar. It's going to stand on the same place here, the Mohammedans, Gentiles. And it's going to stand there. Gentiles means unbeliever. That wasn't the church. Now, that was the Gentiles. See, the unbeliever. I, I want us to notice something here. Brother Brown is actually separating what the Gentiles are doing, the unbelievers, from what the church is doing. Because the church received the word. But when Messiah is cut off for the Jews, he's showing that there's an unbeliever system that rises up, that takes the place of that and becomes a great world religion. Listen what he says. That wasn't the church now. That was the Gentile. See, the unbeliever. Now, and that will stand until the Gentile dispensation will be finished. When the dispensation, uh, when the Gentile dispensation be finished, the great prince is to stand for the people who is Christ at the end time. Amen? And we see him. The scripture proves it. it says he will stand up and show mercy unto Zion. Amen? Now, <coughs> 1961, God being misunderstood. Brother Miriam is actually handling questions, and it's like a questions and answers. And I just want to pick up here, he says in Matthew 24, he spoke of it. The abomination means filthiness that maketh desolation. The abomination was the Muslim mosque of Omar that was built on the temple grounds where the holy place stood. In AD 96, Brother Branham quotes it as that Titus came in and captured Jerusalem and burnt the temple. And they built the mosque of Omar, the Mohammedan religion, right on the temple grounds and still stands there to this day. And it will stand there until God returns to the Jews again. There's a timeline. He says it will stand there until God returns to the Jews again. I almost want to say to you this evening, while it's standing there, you know your loved one can still come in. Something is happening still for the Jews, for the Gentiles. We still can find favor, but there's a point at which God will so favor Israel and the door for the Gentiles will be closed. He says, the abomination that is the mosque of Omar that maketh desolation of the holy place, standing in the holy place. See, Jesus referred to it, says, and, and in parenthesis, let he that readeth understand. Therefore he gives so many days from that time until after that prince and so many days and so forth, which we will get into next Sunday. And Brother Branham is speaking about this because he's coming to the thoughts on Daniel 70 weeks. Amen. And he says it stands there in the holy place, in the standing where the temple stood, the holy place. So I, I trust just through this all, I, I just want us to realize that all of these things, the scriptures, the quotes of the prophet, everything brings us to a specific spot. All of those things, natural, typing a spiritual. I spoke about it this morning, and I never want us to see anything different from the series and that is that each one of us stands in a position where the word of god must be made alive to us when we talk about a holy ground we talk a defile about a defilement of a holy ground we realize that we were never made to be sinners you know brother brown says that he says god never made man to be a sinner Sin is not compatible with our makeup. He made us to be worshipers. 
But sin defiled us. Sin raised another shrine upon us. Shrines of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, all kinds of things. Shrines that are built that need to be torn down. Because ultimately God will raise up that real place of worship. Brother Bram goes back to the book of Daniel and Ezekiel quite a bit on this in one place here. He says, look last night when the Holy Spirit predicted 900 years before the Jews received the Holy Ghost and told them what it would be. The inkhorn, man with the inkhorn writer went through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark in their forehead. You know, I have never seen a denominational pre preacher place that scripture correctly. Brother Brown doesn't put that like many of them still today putting it in some future. Brother Brown is placing it right there when they received the Holy Ghost. There was an early church that believed and he says that was the man with that inkhorn that was marking them that believed, that worshipped. For the rest of them, we know what the scripture said about. He says the ink, man with the inkhorn writer went through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark in their forehead. Is that right? Spoke it before the church was condemned by God and Titus besieged the walls of Jerusalem in AD 96 and burnt the city and there wasn't one stone left upon another according to the prophecy. And today the only thing they got left of the temple is an old wall laying there where they heaped up the stones. And it's rubbed slick where the Jews weep and wail there at the wailing wall. The only thing left of the temple. And the Muslim of Omar stands at the same place and Jesus says, as spoken by the prophet Daniel, when you see the abomination that maketh desolation standing in the holy place, then his underlined in parenthesis, let him that readeth understand. That's right, there it was. And he told how many times it would be until the Gentiles would be, the dispensation will be cut off. They trod the walls down. Then God would return to the Jews. And we're right at that time and we're right at that time another good title would be time zero there's a spot where prophecy and the time for its fulfillment strike the same spot something happens Brother Branham says here, yeah, we're right at that time. Here, now, we're right at that time. Amen. Here's the Jews returning back by the thousands in the last few years. You know, the call is still going out for them to come back. There is still a major drive. We found that there's really a lot of work that needs to be done in Israel and Israel is really saying wherever you've gone wherever you are come back come back there's a place for you amen sometimes we look at things from our own sort of limited perspective here we are in a country uh, what's the distance from by bike bridge down to Cape Town what's it, 1,800 kilometers, probably almost the same if you had to start from east coast to west coast of our country. Long, long distances. And our population at 55,000. So when you come to Israel and you find out that there's 10, 12 million people in a, a little piece that's 40... 50 miles wide, like the Kruger Park, really, 400 kilometers from the bottom tip to the top tip. Uh, I actually said to, I think it was the taxi driver the one time, I said, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in this place. He says, he says no, we've got lots of space. We've got lots of space. And, and their perspective is there's, there's lots more that can come. Amen? 
Why? Because all of those must come because between them somewhere there's 144,000. So, so there's this openness that, that we've got lots of space. We're not running, we're not critical on space. Now, Brother Moran picks up a question on this in Gabriel's instructions to Daniel. Matthew 24, we read this morning. When will this destruction be? What will be the sign of the end and of thy coming? All these things. Now, he says, he's talking to the Jews. They want to know, what about this temple? When will it be destroyed? When will it be rebuilt? When will there come a time that there won't be one stone upon another? How long will it last? So if I'm reading the prophet right, he says they didn't just want to know when does this destruction come. They wanted to know how long will it last? When will it be rebuilt? He said, when you see the abomination that maketh desolation standing, when Daniel stood in the holy place, said, when you see this come to pass, now let him that readeth understand what he's talking about. That's the reason we're praying to God to make that so perfect that there'll be not one shadow of doubt because we're not supposed to put our own interpretation to those things. It's got to come through, thus saith the Lord. So I'm leaving it right here until I understand. You say, well, what a quote to read us tonight, Brother Bram. Brother Gideon. Brother Bram is looking at this, and there's things that he's discussing, and then he says, I'm leaving this point right here until we understand. And then he goes to this. He says, the next phrase he says is, Revealed all things to him, that abomination. And remember, it has a compound meaning. Just like call my son out of Egypt. As Israel was called out, so was Jesus, his son, called out. I want this to strike home tonight. Because we may read Daniel's prophecy. The abomination that maketh desolation stand in the holy place. And we're putting it right there. That's it. You've seen it in Jerusalem. There's the picture. Bang. You know what it means. Brother Bram says there's a compound meaning. In other words, you're going to see it fulfilled in the type and in the anti-type. Because the type was Israel coming out of Egypt. The anti-type was Jesus Christ coming out of Egypt. Amen? An absolute parallel in Scripture. Now, Brother Branham says about this, there's a parallel. In other words, don't just look at that dome of the rock sitting there upon the physical rock where Abraham took Isaac. There's another picture that we must get in our minds. Because the scripture has a compound meaning. Amen. He says, and that will be just exactly take place as certain as I'm standing here. Now he didn't want to say exactly what he saw because he wasn't sure on all of that. But he says, it will take place. Compound. And he did it in a way and he's made it all hid, all hid from the church. Oh, when we get down into that, into the sixfold understanding, how he's got all this hid from the church, so the church will be watching it every minute. Didn't know when he was coming, but now the church age is about over. So it's just ready now for the coming, just getting ready. This is one most important scriptures in the book. What does it do? It tells the closing of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, the scripture, the 70 of weeks. It discloses and tells exactly from the time that Daniel started here until the end of the consummation. It's one of the greatest time pieces. Amen? So now Brother Branham has brought us to understand this. There's a parallel that you must look at. 
I read you the quote earlier where Brother Branham does not talk just about the destruction of Herod's temple by Titus, but he takes you to the temple that was destroyed at Calvary. And the sacrifice there cut off. The one is the type. The other was the anti-type. Now when we come to the end and the switch, there will be the type and the anti-type. Amen? There will be what happens physically in Jerusalem, but there will also be a spiritual application that we see. Now, going through further in this message, Gabriel's instructions to Daniel, Brother Brown says, The nations has declared them a nation this last year. When that hits, we're near the end. The Gentile church is gone. So most any time God could say, Israel is my people. When that is, the Gentiles are finished. Amen? So don't look for the of the mask. Look for the voice of God. He says, they will trot down, said Jesus in Matthew 24. The abomination maketh desolation. They'll trot down the walls of Jerusalem until the Gentile dispensation be finished. When that's finished, then the Jews will return back into Jerusalem. We're already seeing that, right? To reestablish the temple and temple worship. Amen? I'm just reading that to you, the way the prophet says it. He says, when the Gentile dispensation is finished, the Jews will return back into Jerusalem to reestablish the temple and temple worship. Lord willing, at the next session of this, will show you exactly what's happening in Jerusalem. I've spoken about it several times. It's in four quarters. Only one quarter of the city is under Jewish control. When Brother Branham says the Jews come back into Jerusalem, there's that special area that we call the Temple Mountain. Uh, they have a different name for it. But they are not there yet. But believe me, when they have full access back to that, they are not going to let the grass grow under their feet. They are going to build a temple. They are going to re-establish what they left from. Is it necessary? You might look and say, do they need it? They missed the real temple. Rebuilding that is, is, is not what is going to bring them favor. But while the natural thing is going on, there's a spiritual switch. And God switches from the Gentiles back to them. What is He doing? He is doing what He did in John 9. When He takes the blind man and gives him sight. He takes the scales off of their eyes. The scales of their traditions that now is starting to blind the Gentiles. They are blinded by their denominational traditions. They cannot see the true word being manifested anymore. But God is little by little starting to break away the scales off of their eyes and bringing them back to a place of sight. It is striking to realize just how set there is this idea to return back to what was lost. But it can never go back to what was abolished by Jesus Christ. There's got to be another change. So there's a timepiece, material timepiece that's playing out. And that abomination needs to be done away. And a temple needs to come. And they need to reestablish but at the same time, there has got to come an opening of the eyes. Two witnesses come on the scene. Start to minister to them. Start to let them know. We're going to come into that just in a moment. Let me just continue here. He says, when that's finished, then the Jews will return back into Jerusalem. 
I want to say that is not fully accomplished as we speak this evening. There are still places where they can not actually go. To do what? To reestablish the temple and temple worship. We'll get it all in these next messages, the 70 weeks of the sixfold purpose. Now I'll read that before closing because it'd just be, be just about time when, then for us to get home, then come back tonight at 7 o'clock. He says, first, first, if you're putting it down, to finish the transgression. Amen? Now you know that that was already done. That was God's visitation to Israel. Seven years are given to them. It's cut off in the midst. To finish the transgression. Daniel the ninth chapter 24th verse. To finish the transgression. It's the first one. To make an end of sin. Two. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Three. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Four. Now you watch there. There's a switch. Because the one part they got. The one part was done. He dealt with sin. He dealt with iniquity. But now. He brings in everlasting righteousness. Four. To seal up the vision and prophecy. Five. To anoint the most holy. That's a rededication of the temple. But not what they're thinking. What you are. There's a parallel here. There's a natural temple. But there's a spiritual temple. There's a new Jerusalem. There's another here. You've got to see the compound understanding of the scripture here. Amen. And Brother Brown refers to that again. And he goes through it again. Now wait. He says, let me go over it again so you get it. First, finish the transgression. Second, make an end of sin. Third, make a reconciliation for iniquity. Fourth, bring in everlasting righteousness. Fifth, seal up the vision and prophecy. That's really to bring it to its absolute fulfillment. Sixth, to anoint the most holy. Hmm. Just to give you the messages here at the 70th week of Daniel, Brother Bram says, The message has gone forth to the latter church. That's the last church, really. Church that rejected its Christ. The Jews are in their homeland for the spanning space of time, 40 years. Hmm. They've been there now. The new city has been built. And that's true. It's all around. They're watching for what? A coming Messiah. When will it be? I don't know. When that stone smites the image here, she's gone. It's all over then. Amen? That's Daniel's vision. Stone smiting the image at the feet. Amen? Right there at the end of the Roman dispensation, iron and clay mixed together. Now notice here in the middle of the week, three and a half days, three and a half years rather, he breaks the covenant and causes the sacrifice, the oblation that they will have to set up already. Because they'll go right back and say, now look, you are all churches. You can be received in this image unto the beast. We'll have a fellowship. We'll get rid of commun communism. We'll just swipe communism all out of the way. And they can do it, see? And they'll do it. But now watch and set up and set up, set up to this. The daily worship and sacrifice will come back into the city when the temple is rebuilt. And this practice that's to come in the middle of this week will break his covenant and do away with the sacrifices. It said he'll scatter, scatter it. And what he'll do? And it'll last until the consummation. Now, Brother Bram is, is talking a little. He's touching here, touching there. But I want you to see the picture, and I trust I'm seeing it clear. He's talking about them. Here is Israel rejecting it. But there's another system that says, watch, we'll raise up something. We can beat the mark of the beast. We can beat communism. We can do this. We can do this. Just sign up. Just be part of this. Just be part of this. And what's he doing? He's setting up something else. Because the real thing has been cut off. But there's a time for that return. He says, and when will that return come? At the time of the consummation. Really, that's the end of the age. The end of the Gentile dispensation. Then this monstrosity 
of Romanism, Babylonianism, sits on the holy place. I'll read on. It'll maybe become clearer. Brother Bram says, they'll scatter it, scatter it. And what he'll do, and it'll last until the consummation. Notice, the overspreading of abomination to make desolation. The overspreading of abomination. What is abomination? Filthiness. See, to make desolate. What is that? To do away with. The overspreading of this. To do away with that. See, the overspreading of that Roman power. To conquer all the sleeping virgin. Jews and all. We'll all be Roman or we won't be nothing. He'll break his covenant in the middle of the week. Amen. Now you watch what Brother Branham is doing here. Now he shows how Rome came. They cut off in the middle. They crucified Christ. They set up this other thing under a covenant. We'll take care of things. But there's a point where they break that. All of this, may I say 2,000 years almost, is interjected in the middle of this week. So when he says the, the, the covenant is cut off in the middle of the week, he's not saying here, 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 but he's saying at the consummation, that's where that covenant must be broken. And they break their covenant, and now it is absolutely over for the Gentile. God is dealing back with Israel again. Listen, he says, We'll all be Roman or we won't be nothing. He'll break his covenant in the middle of the week. The overspreading of the abomination. If it was the abomination in Jesus' time, when Rome had come over there with their propaganda, it'll be Rome again. It'll be abomination again to the church to make desolate and shall continue unto the consummation. What will he do? He will continue it on unto the consummation. That's the end. So there we thought, we looked at pictures. Isn't it nice? You can go to a place, take a picture and say, there's the abomination that doth make a desolation. And then the prophet of God says, scripture has a compound meaning. You've got to see something else. You've got to see what Rome put in the place of the real worship system. They have put up an abomination that makes desolation. They have put in worship service. Oh, brother, I challenge you this evening. You can go to so-called churches and find people walking into that church dressed in things that the scripture directly calls an abomination. Men wearing women's clothes and vice versa. You'll see women preachers. They're on television. Here, come forth. Hair cut short. Standing there with a man's garment on. Amen. It's an abomination in the sight of God. But to the Christian world, oh, it's lovely. Isn't that wonderful? They have lost it. Why? Because they have switched to the shrine built on the place, but not the right structure. The only thing that can stand on holy ground is the temple that God designed. So you'll find... There's a lot of people trying to convert the Jews right now. Because everybody knows, even, even the so-called Christian world, they know we're right there. They're seeing the interest from the Jews in our faith. But you know they're still trying to sell them a trinity. They can't. They won't fall for it. 
Brother Bram says you can't sell that to a Jew. You can't chop God in three pieces and sell him to a Jew. That's the one thing they know. The Lord your God is one God. That is recited. That is printed in their minds. They repeat that over and over and over. The Lord your God is one God. They know that. So what happens? Brother Bram says this. He says, oh, watch these two prophets when they raise up here. And in the middle of the week, now not notice again, we're in the middle of the week. Right there where the covenant is broken, there's two prophets appear on the scene. In the middle of the week, they're cut off like that. And then starts the battle of Armageddon. Then God begins to speak himself. Then he stands and begins to fight. Doesn't the scriptures say that at that time when, when this switches back, that great prince will stand for the people? God starts to fight for Israel. Amen. Nations are gathered. All nations against them. Amen. Many, many things can trigger that move. We're right in such a time where you can see the, the atmosphere is perfectly right for that. Now notice he says, and God begins to fight. God begins to speak himself. Then he stands and begins to fight. Them prophets are striking the earth. They are preaching the name of Jesus Christ. They are baptizing the same way. They're doing the same thing that the first Pentecostals fathers did. And many are following them. Right at that point, he says, these two prophets arrive. We know from the scripture, Moses and Elijah. Oh my. I just feel a little religious like Brother Branham says tonight. Can you just see Moses? Preaching Jesus. What a powerful minister he would be. When he comes and, and takes the podium. And says oh I just want to tell you. That that priest that was there in the tabernacle that I spoke about. That actually was none other than Jesus Christ. Oh my and I just want to tell you. That lamb that we led there to the altar. And cut his neck. That was nothing else but Jesus Christ. And I just want to tell you. That that light that we lit those candles with. And that was burning there in the holy place. That was none other than the spirit of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Oh, and that glorious day when we had set up the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord came down. I just want you to know that was none other than Jesus Christ. Oh my, brother Elijah, would you like to take a turn? Oh yes, I would. I stood there and I told them Baal is not God. And I had a voice. Somebody told me to take them to a showdown. And the God that answers by fire from heaven, that's the true God. And I just want to tell you, that was Jesus Christ. And somebody says, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they turn with a voice of Peter, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and the promise is back at ground zero. Right where it started, was cut off. Gentiles had their chance. God brings it right back to the same place. Hmm. I want to read the rest of this because I think it's important. And I'll try not to keep you as long as I did this morning making a habit of preaching way too long. They're baptizing. They're preaching the name of Jesus Christ. They're baptizing the same way. They're doing the same thing that first Pentecostals father did, fathers did and many are following them. But that who confederated that organization moved right on down and even the power of those prophets didn't break it and finally they said we'll make it all one organization and he brings in what is it the abomination Romanism 
to overspread the whole thing. Now you see that parallel? You see that? Here you've got an image you can see. There's it constructed. God's doing that to show you. He prophesies. Things come, happen exactly. But there's something else you've got to watch here. The spiritual realm. Here is the physical realm. Here is the types and the shadows. But here is what God is doing. Because it's not about the temple being built right back there. He's got a new Jerusalem. The Lord himself is the temple of it. Amen. All of that, that's natural. But there's another thing here. But while this real temple is in the make, some other shrine has been standing on holy ground. Some other doctrines have claimed Christianity as their faith. Some other demon-possessed men have taken the gospel, diluted it, changed it, hybrid it, and fed it to a people, and it stands there as an abomination. Because, brother, sister, tonight, in every church that calls itself a Christian church, Jesus Christ should be preached. Baptism in His name should be preached. Holiness should be preached. The truth of the Word should be preached. But what is preached today is what people want to hear. And the Scripture says they have heaped together to themselves preachers, teachers, having itching ears. So that they can continue in the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the things of this world and live another abominable life. And call it Christian. How unfitting for holy ground. Romanism. To overspread the whole thing that make desolation. The abomination that maketh desolation takes in everything the filthiness. You see, if we, if we don't keep in mind that there is a compound meaning in Scripture, you can get quite confused when you listen to the prophet's message. Because one moment he tells you the abomination that maketh desolation was built up there by the Mohammedans. And the next time he's talking about it, he's talking about Romanism. I do not think we can avoid touching on Mohammedism, Mohammedanism, or Islam as part of the series. But I just want to let you know that the foundation is Roman Catholic. They are the newest of the three monotheistic religions. Judaism, the oldest. Real Christianity come next, then come Islam. And they're built on the things they learned from Rome. And as they saw Rome alter and change to suit their own objectives, they continued doing the same things with the things that were handed them to the place where you have today an Islam that is quite a problematic condition to the whole world. One side, it's that. On the other side, it's Romanism. Type, anti-type. Now, Brother Bram goes on. He says, remember. Now we're talking about the abomination that maketh desolation. He says, takes in everything, the filthiness. Remember the old mother prostitute that set upon the beast. Right? You remember. Revelations now. We're coming to that woman sitting on the scarlet colored beast. He says, scarlet colored like that had seven heads and ten horns. You remember that? And she had a cup in her hand of the filthiness of her abomination. That was her doctrine that she put out to the people. And there we are, my brethren. We're at the end time. Oh, I wish I could say it the way I, I see it in my heart this, this evening. What is there? Here comes Jesus Christ. The personification. Emmanuel. God with us. The very God of the Bible. The God of the scriptures. Raised up. What did the Romans do? They cut him off. 
and they brought in a cup of abomination. The doctrines that they teach, God is a trinity. That thing has stood over all this period. You talk to people. I, I found many times you talk to people, you start telling them you believe a little different to the churches. One of the first things they want to know is, but you do believe the trinity. My, am I, they're shocked when you tell them, no. It's almost like, okay, you can't be a Christian. Because they have taken that abomination and made that to mean Christian. It's like that eight-walled, eight-sided image sitting on top of the dome, on top of the rock. It doesn't belong. It's out of shape. But they have sold it to the people. It's her doctrine that she put out to the people. Oh, my. That spirit was so strong, that doctrine was so fierce, that you find that men like Martin Luther and John Wesley were still blinded in that respect. It's a fact. Martin Luther was a Trinitarian. Like it or not. He didn't see the truth of that. Why? Because it was lost in the first age when they set up the abomination. But when we come to the end, it's time for the abomination to move. It's time for that structure to get away. It's time for those doctrines to fall. The Lord says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now didn't we just saw, that's what he does to Israel. He sends them an Elijah. Amen. To bring them back to what? To the true God. Amen. Now here, here comes a ministry, Elijah. What's he coming to do? He's coming to deal with the abomination that makes desolation. And he comes out and he starts to teach that God is one God and not a trinity like you've been sold. And he proves that God of the beginning, God of the ground zero, is still God here at the end time and still heals the stick. Still opens blind eyes. Still lets the crippled walk. Still raises the dead. In the name of Jesus Christ. The only wise God. I want to say it's fallen. The revelation of the mystery of God has crumbled the world systems. The abominations are crumbling. Somebody might say, brother, but we are seeing such a proliferation of filth in the earth. Seems like it's just multiplying and multiplying. Let me tell you, brother, sister, while they kept it under covers and wraps, we didn't know the vileness that was inside of the system. But when the word hits it, it starts to crumble. It starts to break. It starts to fall apart. And out of all the cracks ooze the filthiness that they have harbored under the name of Christianity. That's why they hate the message group. Because it's the prophet that God gave us that came with a decisive word that exposed the abomination. And Reiki says here, this is that. You've got the natural it's standing there in Jerusalem. But there's also a spiritual. There's another application. Oh my. I'll close by going to this scripture. There's many, many more things. Lord will help us. I trust if we're still here to just touch more of these things. Let's just turn quickly to Revelations 21. Oh my. Look at this. And I saw new heaven and a new earth. Didn't the Lord say, I make all things new? He's a God of restoration. He's a God of redemption. Amen. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, remember who is John? Types the bride. Saw the holy city with the mosque of Omar. With the dome of the rock, whatever you want to call it. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, 
adorned for her husband. Now you understand why I say ground zero. It's laying within you. You were supposed to have been a son and a daughter of God from the very beginning. Sin came and put something else on your life. And you were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. But through the blood of Jesus Christ and the preaching of the truth, the shrines of man-made dogmas and creeds have been broken down and you can burst forth and become this manifestation. There she stands, the new Jerusalem, adorned as a bride, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the temple, the dwelling place of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Right back to the original faith, the original principles. Hmm. You read yourself there just a moment. I trust you're reading yourself in the series. And you realize what God has really done for us. Because there was a time where we were so far away from God. And we had all kinds of ideas and shrines. But I thank God for a ministry that breaks it down. And makes place for the true temple of the Most High. The last thing he does, the last purpose of the visit of Gabriel to uh, to Daniel was to establish that righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy, finally to anoint the most holy. What is the most holy? It's where God dwells. And where does He dwell? Is there not now an invisible union between the heavenly bridegroom and the earthly bride? You see that parallel? Some people visit Israel. I want to say this as respectfully as I can. They come back all twisted up because they want to emulate Judaism because they found something genuine in it. So they think they can get closer to God by emulating something that has actually missed the point. But Sister Kathy and I found ourselves coming back from Israel And this message and this Bible has just become so alive because we see it in the spiritual. We see it in the realities of our own walk with God. We see it in in all that is, is happening there. There's another side. There's a compound meaning. What they are looking at here, there's something else God is showing us here. May God help us when we read the scripture, when we look at the types and the shadows that we'll always remember. That the real thing is the spiritual. Paul says the natural will pass away. But there's a new Jerusalem. That which is from heaven. That does not pass away. Which is the mother of us all. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand to our feet. Can we sing that little chorus? We are standing on holy ground. Oh yes. We're on ground zero. And I know that there are angels all around, just like they appeared at that rock of sacrifice. So I believe that same God appears here to the true church in the end time. Amen. Angels ministering to us. Theophanies right here with us. What a time. What a place. See this transition. See this change over. I trust you can read the signs of the times. May God help us. Hallelujah.